lot of abuse and a lot of being beaten up by um, the people that are supposed to be taking care of you in there. The, I don't know if you want to call them counselors or staffs mm-hmm. that watch you. Um, yeah, they were uh, they were abusing us in there. They were abusing a lot of us. I want to say everybody, but maybe some people slipped through the cracks. But majority of the people got abused and beaten. <laughs> Hey, everybody, it's me, Sadia Sanders, returning for my continuation of the McLaren Hall series, McLaren Hall's The Sin of Being a Single Woman in Poverty. And today I have a guest, Robert Barella, who's going to talk to us about his experience. But before we get started, make sure you're subscribing to the channel, click the like button and make sure you share this video. So, Robert, how are you doing? I'm doing good today. I'm doing just fine. Thank you. Good, good. So you reached out to me. You saw another one of my videos and said, hey, I was in McLaren Hall. I grew up in the system, essentially, and I have my story to tell. And I want to share the story on your platform. So you share with me off camera that you entered the foster care system at the age of one. That's correct. So what was going on during that time that you were removed from your family? Okay. Um, when I got re- removed from my family, it's because my mom was a um, drug addict. She used heroin and um, she was under the influence all the time. So what happened is uh, I was taken away from my mom as a baby. Um, I was a preemie baby. I was born um, earlier. So from the drug addiction she had, uh, she gave birth to me early. And when I was born, they took me away from my mother. And I ended up going to McLaren Hall as a newborn baby. And I stayed there. And I continually graduated through the whole entire system, starting from a baby to um, a young boy, and from a young boy to a a juvenile, from a juvenile to becoming an adult. And then they emancipated me out of there. So... What so would you, you like in the system? Yes. So also, when you went to McLaren Hall at one, mm-hmm. what happened from one until you were placed? Because McLaren Hall supposedly was an emergency shelter until uh, you could be found a home or a foster home. Right. So what happened is uh, I was going to foster homes um, and they were trying to put me up for adoption, but my mom was fighting, trying to get sober, and she kept getting custody, and then she would use drugs, so I would go back and forth in and out of the system from foster home to foster home. So that's what was going on through, like, one through until she died. She passed away when I was 10, so that's when I was permanently stuck in the system. Mm-hmm. But one through 10, we were bouncing through different foster homes where things happened. And when I say we're, I wasn't alone. I had an older brother and an older sister that was in the system with me. Um, to this day, I don't know where my sister's at. I lost connections with everybody because of this foster care system. At first, the foster homes allowed us to stay together. And then they took us and separated us and made us all go to different homes. Uh, why? I don't know. But things happen to every uh, all of us. You know, I could say from my, let me speak for myself. Um, I was abused, uh, molested. A lot of bad things happen. And I, I spoke out and I talked and I told on these people and Nobody, uh, nobody believed me. They said that we were lying and it wasn't just me. There was many kids that, that came forth and said stuff, but they never wanted to believe us. They said that we were liars. So when you reported the abuse, where were you at that point? Were you at McLaren Hall? You were in the foster home. I reported it. Uh, no, I was just scared because when it happened in the foster home, you're scared, you're scared. So you wait to talk to your social worker and your social worker takes you back to McLaren Mm. up and told them. And then also it started happening at McLaren Hall, too. That's what the problem was. Um, Yeah, Uh, a lot of abuse and a lot of being beaten up by um, the people that are supposed to be taking care of you in there. I don't know if you want to call them counselors or staffs Mm -hmm. that watch you. Um, Yeah, they were uh, they were abusing us in there. They were abusing a lot of us. I want to say everybody, but maybe some people slipped through the cracks. But majority of the people got abused and beaten so how many months or weeks were you at mclaren hall before it would say okay we're gonna send you to this foster home and then your mom would try to get you back failed attempt and then you go back to mclaren so what was the time frame like each and every time 
Wow, that's a good question because it was never the same. It was always different because they have to have different facilities to take you. Like there's a Penny Lane, there's um, Children's Village, there's CBH, uh, Cottage Home. There was uh, Rancho San Pedro Group Home. There was Fred's Group Home. There was um, so, so many more um, place. I was at so many facilities and I'm talking about from anywhere from a foster home to giant facilities. Mm. Uh, there's so many names I, I, I can run through that I went to. I was at group homes that had 200 boys in them. Wow. Uh, yeah, big facilities too. So I went to McLaren and maybe I'd stay for three or four weeks, a month, sometimes longer. Every time I went back, it was never the same. There was times I went, it was a week, and then they shot me out back out to a group home. But then something would happen. They would abuse me and I'd run away. And then I would call my social worker or I would call this number called Covenant house nine line that's for runaways mm. um, i would go stay there and then they would end up telling me look are you department to serve if you're foster care we need to send you back so wow. they worker would come get me and take me back to mclaren yeah so it was just a repeated thing but um <clears throat> never the same uh every time it was different so sometimes i would stay months sometimes i mean there was times i stayed probably 90 days like i would really stay there um I remember, I remember a lot of stuff about that facility. What was your first memory of McLaren? Because you were a baby when you went the first time. I remember, what I can remember is when I was um, a little boy, almost, a, I want to say a teen almost, but not a teen. When I remember they used to have dances there. It was co-ed and they used to have Friday dances and the girls and boys used to get together and we would, uh, we would dance, hang out and have a good time. They were called, the girls were called the Pixies. They were the Pixie yeah. kind in that cottage it's called the pixies so they were in that one and then there was tiger tiger dorm junior boys senior boys i think i i know i was in all of them emancipate i went from every single one through all the years mm. i believe i'm remembering probably at uh junior boys yeah okay so they have these dances and then after the dance then what you just go back to are you in school every day well, you go back to your dorms or whatever you want to call them, dorms, cottages, units. Um, what it was is what I was uh, explained to when we were in there. We were f trying to figure out as kids why we're in these big walls like this that are painted with colors of stuff. And when we go out to the recreational field, they would let us go outside and we'd mm -hmm. go out there and we'd look around and say, where are we at? And it turned out that we found out that it used to be an old uh, juvenile hall that was donated. I heard this is what we heard that was donated to the Department of Children's Services to home kids that are orphans and to for the foster care system. Yeah, McLaren Hall did start off as um, a facility under the uh, juvenile system. So you had juvenile delinquents. And then for whatever reason, once the facility turned into children of abuse in the foster care system, orphan, like you said, then uh, that was before the Department of Children and Family Services was even created. Like you were sharing with me before that when you entered the system, there was no DCFS as we know it. That's right. It uh, wasn't called Department of Children's Services. That was the name of it. And then prior to that, there wasn't even Department of Children's Services. It was social services. Yeah, social so, services. Mm -hmm. That's right. exactly so what it was. Everything was just kind of mixed in together. So when you were there, it was probably before the time where they were even separating the abuse, abusive kids, like the violent kids and the kids with mental issues, they weren't separating them at one point. Oh, you're on it. Oh man, you hit a big thing. I didn't even think that that would be brought up. You're on a good point right there. I was in there when the kids were mentally, because mentally, uh, and then the kids that were, they were from all different walks of life. They had gang member kids in there that were from gangs. And they were coming in there and they would let them beat up on the normal kids. Like me, I wasn't a gang affiliated. I had my, I was in there because my parents were drug addicts. My dad already had passed away. So my mom was left to try to fend for us. And um, she, like I said, I was in and out of the system. So um, me and my brother and sister were raised in that system. So I want to say that McLaren Hall basically raised us all the way for me, it's all the way to adult and let me out. But what can I tell you about this place? Other than 
I would like to tell you the wrong stuff that was done if you want to hear it. Yeah. Okay. Um, there was a staff, I believe it was uh junior boys or it might have been senior boys. He might have worked in both actually, but his name was CC. And he he was known for always saying this, I'm gonna stick to you like white on rice. He would let uh things bad happen to you. He would let the kids come into your room and beat you up. They did bad things. Uh they would uh, abuse you. They would hit you, hurt you. I remember we were talking about sometimes the. it never happened to me, but it happened to other kids in the rooms with me. They got peed on and stuff. I don't know if that's appropriate to say, but yeah. those are the things. And, um, but there was, um, I was reading some of the survivor stories and someone was saying that there was a staff person who would always say, well, you know, I'm going to, you're going to be sent to the uh, a mental facility. Okay. Are you talking about the, I don't, I don't, there is also there's the room called at the end of every wing. Every unit has it. It's called the R and R room. Rest and relaxation room is the pro- professional name. I would say that that what they called it, but really that's not what the room was like for. Solitary was, confinement. Yeah, exactly what it was. Mm-hmm. It was like they'd throw you in there and they would let kids in there to beat you up. They would let you stay in there until you peed or pooped on yourself. Um, it was it was a torture room, is what it was. Mm. Uh, us. yeah and uh they wouldn't you didn't have to do anything bad all the time to go there no they would just pick and choose like to have fun with people like hmm. the kids they put me in there a few times and there's like no way of really showing that you're being good to get out of there it's just whenever they feel like coming and releasing you they say that they're only going to put you on a five minute timeout but it never works that way at least it didn't for me Mm-mm. now did you see because you were in and out so often throughout your childhood did you see any changes for the better or worse with the different administrations, because from my research, it was, there was a new executive director. Like every time you turn around, there's okay. This person is out. This person comes. Okay. Then, you know, something's going on under their leadership and they're out. So did you see any changes uh, just administratively during all the times you were in and out? When I look at it like that, I want to say that, uh, I was bouncing around so much. I'm going to tell you that I didn't see any changes. It looked like the place was getting worse. Like they let people do what they wanted. The kids were out of, always out of control. It was it was chaos. The only time they could ever control the kids is when the people came to donate good, uh, stuff for holidays. That's the only time they can control stuff. They used to have a special day. I forgot what it's called, but they would come and groom you. They'd give you haircuts and they'd paint your face and just do different little activities for you. And you'd be inside of a basketball court and a, inside there and uh some movie stars would come donate stuff and stuff like that but i mean that's the only like uh thing i can remember they could do to kind of keep us under control is give us stuff like you know to try to keep everybody calm other than that it was it was a big front Mm. but what would only act right when um sometimes you could see like important people come with clipboards or something and you know they're from the outside and they're coming to check on stuff so they would come and tell us ahead of time hey you guys better be cool because this will happen to you if you don't act right when these people come so we were threatened you know now did you ever witness any kids being hosed because i heard that that was happening too with the kids they were being fire hosed or um what is it the garden hose down if they weren't doing what they wanted them to do I don't want to say hoes, but I've been, we've been stripped down naked and thrown in the showers. That's for sure. And that just was, because. Uh, they were famous for that. Just forcing us in the showers and making us strip down for no reason. And just, it was pretty strange. Pretty mm-hmm. strange. I had to look at it because I was too scared. So I never looked at it as now as an adult and knowing the walk in life, how to see things. I kind of just, I knew something was not right though, you know, that's for sure. But they loved doing that, getting us all naked and throwing us in the shower and together. And it was just not right, the things they were doing. But you couldn't say nothing because you say something, they'll beat you up or they'll have the other kids. I don't know how they did it, but they had a way. Oh, they had a room called the honor door. Hmm. It's a special room. Both sides. There's two wings usually in the cottage or unit, whatever you want to call it. And on one side of the unit, there's an honor dorm. It's a special room where like for that's how they control the kids to go do what they wanted for them. And uh, they would let them have like a record player and they would have special things in that room and they got to kind of do what they wanted. But the reason why they got the honor dorm is because they did what the staff said. If you get my drift on that, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. go beat him up or go do these things. They went and they did it. Mm. 
And what do you think the staff was getting out of basically pitting you against each other? They thought it was funny. They thought it was that there was like a good time to them, like we were a show or something. They thought it was funny. Yeah. And how many people did you witness, and I guess including yourself, try to run away from McLaren, like hop the wall or whatever? Oh my goodness! For me, I got to speak for myself because I was raised from a, a one year old to the to all the way through the whole system, through everything I went through, like graduation, through all the grade levels, if you want to say, um, hundreds, hundreds of people, girls, boys, everything, and and people were all messed up. We were all messed. I myself, I know that I'm just barely getting better. I am 47 years old now, by the grace of God, and um, I want to say that. I barely just barely getting back on my feet and coming to a conclusion. I was really damaged because of that place in my life. It tore, it took my life from me. I was, I thought there was no hope for me. The people always told me that they do people like you die in prison or you're going to end up dead on the streets as a drug addict. And that's, a, that's what was kind of happening. Uh, and I started believing this stuff. They had me doped up on medications too. I've been on medications since I was uh, um, in like junior boys. I know that maybe a little younger than that even. I want to say before my mom passed away, 10 years old, I was on medications. They've had me on Ritalin, Thorazine, mes Mescalo, something like that, uh, Milleril, any other medicines. I've been in, uh, to this day, I'm on medicine, but I'm starting to have the doses drop to get off medicine. I don't want anything. I want to be, I want my life back, you know, and that's what I'm getting right now. I'm fighting for my life back. These people took so much from me. Em, I want to say my brother and sister, I can't... I know them. they're my family. I love them, but I don't know where my brother's at right now. And my sister, I could try to look at my brother, my sister. I don't even know if she's alive to this day, but mm. they all went through, you know, and um, it's just a bad thing. And I, me being a person that was raised in all that, going through all that stuff, I try to speak out so many different times that nobody wanted to believe us. Nobody just, nobody cared. And you know what? Nobody wanted, nobody cared. One time, one person tried to uh, care. His name was one of my social workers. His name was Ken Capel. I don't know if he's still alive. He was pretty old back then. He was a social worker for me and my brother and my sister. Yeah, he, he seemed like he really cared. Like, like if he could adopt us, he would have. Yeah. He was like the one of the nicest people I ever met. Um, I told him what happened, and he said, we'll see. We'll look into it, but we have to be careful. I don't know what all that meant, you know, because I was just a kid, you know. But he said, well, we'll see what we can do, but. Nothing never could happen. We could never prove anything. You got to be able to prove stuff. And it just, it was a nightmare. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately with kids, and I see this happen over and over and again, where because kids are not believed or taken seriously, then the trauma not only continues, but it could result in death of that child. It, oh, yeah. No, hey, there were suicides there while I was there. Pe kids killed themselves. Yes, they killed themselves. People died in the R&R &R room. A kid here and there died in an R and R room. What else happened? Uh, I'm sure people try to climb the wall and probably fell off and hurt themselves bad. Yeah, people were really jumping off the. There's a, a base. There was a baseball field in there and the diamond thing, but it was set up and it was so far. But when kids want out, you won't believe the extent they go. These kids were jumping from that gate trying to hop on the wall and they would break their legs. It was crazy. It mm -hmm. was crazy. Yeah, it just wow. Things the I've area seen. El Monte was gang infested too. Or, All out. Like the yeah. 80s, I would think. So if you ran away, then you have to get through the gangs too. Exactly. And it was bad, worse for colored people, brown people, or um, because the gangs were Hispanic. So it was worse for browns or blacks, you know. But for the whites, I don't know how that worked. But for us, it was a living nightmare if you even try to go and escape from that place and, and get out of those walls. Because immediately you'll get attacked right there. That's how bad it was right there. So you had to make a decision. Which was worse, you trying it or, you know, just taking it? Right. So when you left McLaren Hall at, did you age out uh, in a foster home at like 17, 18? Or were you in McLaren Hall once you were emancipated from the system? No, what it was is they kind of got tired of me being there, like going back and forth, going back and forth, going back and forth. Okay, when my mom died, I ended up going to a mental institution. They took me to a mental institution. I couldn't tell you how long I was there. I wore a nightgown. They don't have like calendars or clocks in there. So you don't know what time it is or what month. They don't want you to know none of that. So, but eventually I kind of learned the rules and I learned that you need to show them that you're not, like you're, 
you're not crazy. That way they'll let you out. And eventually, I don't know, I think I was there almost a year, something like that. And they let me out, but then they took me back to McLaren Hall again. Yeah, so, oh, how did I leave? So that's how that was going back and forth, back and forth. But how I left there is it's, uh, <laughs> I was going to school in the Valley. My brother got custody of me. The courts gave my brother custody of me, even though that he was in foster care too. At 18 years old, that's what I mean. They wanted to get rid of me. They were tired of it us going back and forth and it's like i was maybe i don't know how they looked at it maybe i was taking up space or they can let somebody who knows what but they were like okay let's give him custody uh it's weird my own social worker didn't want to let me go with my brother that's the weirdest thing i ever seen i've seen some strange stuff yeah so my social worker is supposed to be fighting for me to have better life and didn't let me go stay with my brother but hey the judge granted it and let me go stay with my brother so we made it for a little while and then my brother uh, got in trouble with the law. He mm. went to prison. I was supposed to go back to Department of Services. But I had a friend at school. We went to special ed school together. I've been a special ed my whole life. Um, but uh, my buddy, his name was Vincent. And uh, me and him were like almost like, you know, I want to say brothers. We were real close buddies. And uh, the mother had a lot of love for me because she knew my life and my background. And she knew how to have, I was an orphan and stuff. So she kind of like, came over because her son Vince used to come stay at my house even though he had a mom and stuff he would be like almost living with us so he would come visit us all the time every day every day and spend the night and everything and I had no problem with it so his mom came one night and she she's a chef at a hospital she, she passed away from colon cancer rest her soul mm -hmm. um, yeah she used to bring food because she worked as a chef every day to us hamburgers french fries and stuff so she uh came and she was like hey what's going on and she Vince went down and told her he was like yeah uh Robert's brother um got locked up and in in they're gonna kick him out of this place because it's under Rudy's name so she was like no he's not you tell him to come down here right now so I went down there and she was like uh you're gonna come home with me and I was like I am <laughs> so um, I went with her and then we were like well we can't just do that you know so we had to tell the social worker we contacted them Somehow, I don't remember exactly how it went down, but we contacted them and she made it happen where they allowed her to take me in as a, to a, like not adopt me, but as a foster kid to just let me go live with her. She was your guardian, basically. Yeah, that's how I did. And I went with her and she was a nice lady. She, um, I want to say she loved me. She did pass away from colon cancer. And yeah, that's what happened with that situation. So that's how I ended up leaving out of the system, though. Yeah, that's how I departed from it. But that was at 17, I want to say. Mm. So after you moved in with your friend's family, your brother's locked up, mm. how long was it before you left that family and you were kind of on your own or what was going on during that time? Okay, what happened with that is uh, we kind of, like I said, we were in special ed. But we were experimenting with drugs because um, I used to take medication still. I was taking medications that they were giving me from from even when I was in foster care. They told her, look, if you take him, he's got this, 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 and he has to take it. So I had to continue taking meds. And then um, we started experimenting with uh, drugs and stuff, street drugs, because I started getting depressed and stuff. Because I don't, I don't want to, well, maybe you can consider it flashbacks. I started thinking about the stuff that happened to me. Yeah, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. You, you know, that stuff is not gone. It kicked in and I started having bad uh, thoughts in my head. And I, I was like, dude, I started thinking about what happened in my life. Why is my life like this? Why don't I have parents? Why did I get this kind of stuff? Why did these things happen in McLaren Hall? Why didn't, oh, I was supposed to be adopted. And, and I was in this, uh, this Stevenson's group home uh, that, Eagleston's group home. There it is. That one's in uh, Baldwin Park. It's a big facility too. There, a lady came and uh, <clears throat> she wanted to adopt me. <laughs> I know it's like a dream. She was from Paris. She came all the way from Paris. And this lady told me, oh, look, uh, I want to put you in my house. I got a big house. We live in a castle. She, I don't know. She told me she lived in the castle. Um, was she said, look, I will America? Like, where did she come from? Like, why was she in... Yeah. California. She wanted to adopt children from America. I the only way I can look at it. So, um, yeah, she came there and they they pulled me out. I went and the lady said she wanted me. I remember that's what she told me. But then, like I told you, there's some twisted stuff in the system. I don't understand it, but um, I really don't. These people are supposed to be helping us. I just cannot believe it. Um, 
they told her some, she's told me, I want, I, you're going to come with me. I want to take you home. So then they took her into the room after, after she told me all that stuff. Um, they took her into the room. I don't know what they told her. I really don't. Whatever it did, it convinced her not to want me. And she didn't tell me there. She just, I didn't see her again. She left and she sent me a letter with mm -hmm. a box of peanut brittle. And they called me into the office of like, oh, I want to send this lady, sent this to you. And I looked at it, opened it up, and they read it to me because my reading comprehension, I'm a special ed, I'm not that, was not that high at all. So they was like, look, the lady's telling you that she's not going to be able to accept you into her home, but this is something for you. And I was like, wow. And that was, this is, it happened twice. Even when I was younger, um, they took me to some canyon country or something like that. And it was a nice, rich home. I want to say white people, <laughs> they're white people. <laughs> had a son already yeah. and he had and i had a there no i want to say i had a bedroom they were sizing me up they like had actual like uh, measurements of how big they wanted the kid to be and i happened to fit the size and everything and they wanted me they were like oh this is perfect this will be your room they're already telling me everything this will be your room you see how our son has he had a computer everything old school one <laughs> anyways so they went to this room and it was identical exactly what was in that room was in this room so i was like wow this is awesome toys everything big backyard the whole shebang like a kid that doesn't have parents is dream like wow this is awesome so then um i don't know what they did but every time they separated us they wanted me but when they separate us and they talk why do you have me go to somewhere and let somebody interview me and then take me away and tell them bad things or something about me where they don't want to take me in anymore i never thought it I was just a kid, but it was the most weirdest things ever. And uh, I thought the social workers, like I said, Ken Capel, if you're still alive out there, thank you, sir. Uh, that man, he's the only one out of all my social workers who really cared, like try to fight for us as best as he could without losing his job. Because, you know, <laughs> that's how it is back then. If you try to stick up or get involved, your nose in anything to try to be part of anything to help somebody like in a, in a, when you accuse somebody, you say these kids come to the front line, say something. You can't say that because if you do, then everybody's gunning after your job and gunning after you trying to get you in trouble. I might try to hurt you. Who knows what? Well, what were they diagnosing you with that you were given all these medications so young and put in a mental facility at 10? They were trying to say bipolar schizophrenic. And I'm sure there was many other things, but those are for some I know for sure. Yeah. But I don't believe in any of that, dude. I think they were diagnosing me just to test uh, medications out on me personally because they had some me on so many different things. And then some doctor would come and he would like look at me like a exhibit A, exhibit B type of thing. Like he would look at me and check me to see how I was doing. And there was medicines that uh, had me. I remember one time in a group home, they had to uh, send emergency doctor in. I would have died, I believe, because of that on the medications they gave me they gave me something and i would they had a little arcade room i was playing arcades and out of nowhere my jaw started spazzing out like that and my tongue swole up and it almost swole up where i couldn't breathe mm. and if i come on time i'm sure i would have not made it but he came all the way to the facility from his home gave me some medicine got it down my throat and it made everything the reaction go backwards so oh lord i remember that that was one of the most scariest things in my life and what that was like about like eighties, nineteen eighties around that time. Yes, anywhere from uh yeah, yes. My mom died in eighty eight, so it was between the, yeah the the later eighties and the early nineties, between just there. Yeah, because it, I'm hearing that a lot with survivors and saying you know they kept us doped up, they kept us on medication, and you're wondering, okay, well where are you getting the diagnosis from? How are you justifying this medication and is it like within the healthcare system, we know that pharmaceutical companies, you know, there's, there's big business in that. Oh, so yeah. Reps to the hospitals to sell you on this drug, that drug, you know, whatever. But with children, it's like, how are you, where are you getting these diagnoses from? Right. These kids. And you've gotten them on like five different medications. Right. No, I ain't seriously. That's exactly what I'm. Yes, you're right on that. And also there was another facility. It was called Optimus Boys Home. I know a lot of people that are going to watch this video are going to connect with that Optimus Boys Home. That was the name of it. I'm trying to remember where it was at. I don't know if it was in Glendale, but it was somewhere in Los Angeles County. Optimus Boys Home, big facility. They used to take in criminals all the way from San Francisco for the 415 Bay Area that were grown. Like I'm talking 17 that were, uh, they were bringing them criminals into the group home with the foster kids and blending them in. And it was total chaos. And that's the time that I was on the medications too, really bad. They had me all doped up really bad. So it's, yeah, man, I was terrible on that stuff. Um, uh. And were you able to, at some point, 
show that, okay, I don't need all these medications. Was it when you were completely out of the system that you were able to kind of gradually get off? Or did they keep you on like up until what point? Uh, let me show you. I went from all those diagnoses to still taking medication, but I, I they sent me meds, but I really don't take them. The reason why I don't take them is because I need to get off these meds. These meds are not good for me. This is described for me from a psych doctor. This right here, this is Seroquel, 200 milligrams. I used to be at 800. Now they're reducing my dose, you know? But that's what I wanted. I don't want on these medications no more at all. Look, this one right here, you know what this is? This is an actual narcotic. This is Xanax. This mm. is a street cell. Would you believe that? I don't want these meds no more. I don't want to take them, and I won't take them. But who's sending they, them to you? Take them. I'm tired. I need my life back. I've been controlled from the government and through the facilities like that, and I'm tired. I need to go on my life, and I'm here on this earth for a purpose, and it's not for that. Well, who's sending you these medications? Like, who's writing the prescriptions? These ones, these are from the doctors from some kind of community. Uh, what is it called? This one's from a farmer mar uh, farm market pharmacy, and it's from, I believe, where is it at? Oh, here we go. Here it is right here. Glad I keep everything handy. This is from Mission City Community Network. And what do they do? They're psychic doctors that you go down and you tell them how's the medication doing this and that. And um, and just they ask you about your life and try to talk to you, you know. Uh, the same thing the other doctors used to do when I was little. And that's how they know your diagnosis. And But that's about it. Yeah, that's what they so are. They just followed you from childhood all the way to now. Yeah. Yes. Believe it or not, I was I ended up being a drug addict most of my, my whole life. Not most. My whole life. And I've been, I got six years clean right now, by the grace of God. Mm -hmm. I got clean and, um, and I was in prison. I spent most of my time in jail because uh, I struggled in life because of all these things that happened in my childhood. I was never had a real chance in life to do anything. My opportunities were shot down immediately. Like I was telling you, when I had a, a, a opportunity to be part of that family in Canyon Country or to go with the lady uh, to Paris, they shut my opportunities down immediately. So, yeah, I was stuck to with this these cards that were dealt to me. So with the social services, when you were in prison, out of prison, how do, I guess, your benefits work where it's saying, OK, well, here's uh, are you on um, Social Security? SSI, how do you, because usually if you don't have a traditional job and you're not on some type of public assistance, you don't have any health care um, right. and you're not seeing a psychiatrist, you're not getting prescribed psych drugs. So how are you maintaining all of that? Right. What's going on is I am on SSA. I'm on social security assistance. Okay. Yeah. But I don't, I don't, I look, I, I want like right now, my record is messed up right now. I have papers right now. With the expungement, ever since I got baptized and my life has changed, uh, I got people, I'm a member of a church and I, I'm doing things, giving back and doing the right things and people are helping me. Um, I got people that are fighting on my side finally, like you. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Okay. So by that being said, um, I have people from my church that helped me get uh, the foundation of like um, the right organizations. I used to have a lot of tattoos on my face and all over the place. I go to tattoo removal now. I've got a lot of stuff for, uh, to taking off my face and to change me so I can be what I'm supposed to be myself. Also my record for the, the mistakes I made. I paid my time fair and square. I did my time and those things are holding me back. You know, so right now I'm going to uh, a, a program of uh, expungement and I'm just waiting for results right now. That's it. So, you know, the ball is being bounced right now on the court and I'm just waiting for it to be given back to me. So I have the answers, but I believe everything's going to go good. Yes, I trust. How long um, were you in prison for? Uh, Three years. Okay. Three years. I was in there for stealing a car, petty theft, little stuff like that. I wasn't a, a really bad person or something like that or violent, but they they did try to make me out to be a person like that. 
because um, when you don't have a family or somebody to bail you out and things like that, and they find out that you're like a kind of a street person, they don't want you around. They just try to throw you like they want to get rid of you. So that, you know, and that's not fair. That's not fair to a lot of people, you know, but that's how it was for me because it started all the way from the beginning, going back to McLaren Hall. I never had a chance, never had a chance, but now I'm getting that chance. I'm getting that second chance at life and I'm going to jump on it. And that's why I'm glad I, I happen to be uh, seeing your thing uh, about McLaren Hall. Something hit my mind. I've been wanting to know how we could sue, Mc, uh, how I could sue, Mc, sue McLaren Hall a long time ago, but I wasn't sure how to do it. I don't have no personal money on my own to try to hire a lawyer or anything like that. So when I looked it up and you popped up, I was like, no way, this is crazy. I was like, this is this is like a miracle happening here. So let me reach out and see if I can get a hold of you. And it happened. So these are just doors and opportunities opening. I see that. So now were you able to because like I was sharing with you, um, that was about 2022. Yeah, two years ago, June. Um, so maybe a little less than two years when the media got a hold of the uh, class action suit for LA County because McLaren Hall is owned by Los Angeles County. So these plaintiffs are suing the county. Right. So um, it went from a group of 12 to now it's like 3,012. Wow. Uh, people started, you know, coming out when all the commercials and the social media ads and the press and things like that. So were you able to get a hold of any of these law groups? to add your claim? I didn't even know anything about nothing. First of all, we had the pandemic going. So between the pandemic and also, yeah, just by the pandemic. And I live in a trailer park and we're fighting against manager trying to evict people here to to get them off his property. He wants to sell it. My mind was in a whole different uh, thing. I didn't even know this McLaren Hall thing existed mm. on the anything. If I would have knew, I would have been immediately on it. Immediately, because... This is an opportunity me to get some claim something back for what was taken for me that can help me give me the upper hand right now, especially in my life because I'm 47, I'm older, and I haven't had any help from nobody. I mean, what they give me, it's peanuts. It just barely pays my rent, you know, mm -hmm. and take that now too, especially because I went live. When they see that, they're going to probably take away my SSA, but it's okay. Uh, I trust. I trust that my record will get expunged and I can go get a job like a normal person can because that's what I want to do. I want to go back and I want to work. I need to go to work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what so I want to do. Done with your probation and everything. You completely. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Then yeah. yeah. I've been off uh, problems with the law for maybe thirteen years now. No oh. problem. That's good. Well, definitely um, the law firm that I can't think of off the top of my head, the one that um, Ben Crump joined forces with, because Ben Crump is like the civil lawsuit attorney and when he gets involved it's about like we're trying to get these people compensated for whatever they went through so i'll give you the name of that law firm because okay. like you said you know the phone number that they had for people to join the suit that's you know dead at this point but that doesn't mean you can't still join the suit i don't know one way or the other but at least you can call the law firm um, okay. during the week and just see like hey you know, is there any way that I can can join? I don't know what criteria they use to kind of vet you and make sure, OK, well, were you really there? You know, because people can't find their records. Right. So I don't know how people are able to say I was there and they're actually, you know, believed. Right. Um, I, I can look into that. I, I, I'm going to do some uh, research of my own. There's got to be a way that they can open up my 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 records. I, I mean, I hope they got to find them. My whole my whole childhood and everything is in there and they know it. So let me see what I can do. I'm going to I'm going to talk to some people. And one of my 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 buddies from church, uh, he's at a law firm. So I don't know if he can help, but I'm going to just start reaching out to different people and see if somebody can help me. Yeah, for sure. You know, don't don't give up on that. Right. I mean, it's L.A. County. They got plenty of money. <laughs> <laughs> so you tell me you're married now. So how did you meet your wife? Well, I met my wife. Uh, I met her, I want to say before the pandemic. Yes, on um, I met her on Facebook. <laughs> and I've been talking to her for quite a while. And I wanted to marry her a long time ago. But the thing was, because the pandemic and I had no uh, passport, 
I didn't know if things were possible to do that. So now where is she from? As you say, a passport. Oh yeah. She's in Kenya, Africa. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> in a group or how did you meet her on Facebook? Um, I, like I got, like I told you, I got baptized and after I got baptized, uh, you know, you look out there at Facebook for like scriptures and you, you connect with people that are, are into the Lord, you know, and that's what, uh, she started reading some of my stuff that I would throw out there to, you know, to speak to the people and let them know, you know, God, this God, that. And, and then she started giving some back and I was like, wow, these are beautiful. I said, this lady is a servant of the Lord. And I said, this is what kind of woman I need. I need somebody that's of God, somebody that's not going to hurt me, somebody who's going to love me. And, and, you know, what better to do that through the Lord? So that's how that happened. And uh, I seen that she was compatible for me. And uh, what happened is she, we're both baptized in the same church. We're the same Orthodox. Um, we're from the same doctrine. So it worked out perfect. Even though she's way out there, we have churches out there. Mm-hmm. So because, What yeah. church is it? Apostolic faith in Jesus Christ, assembly of Christ, yes, divine fortress. That's what we're called. <laughs> yes, but there's different ones depending what area you're at. But yeah. we're all. Um. Yeah. So, I met her, and then what happened is we we wanted to get married, but because um, because I didn't have a birth certificate, because it, it starts all off with a birth certificate. You have to have one, and I couldn't get one. Now this is the crazy part. Remember, because I told you I was foster care, so um, for some reason I was born um. February 13, 1977, I was born, and um, the year that I was born or something like that, the, maybe it might have been the month, uh, at that time, they were not giving out the records. You have to go to Sacramento to get them. Mm-hmm. So by that, they closed a Sacramento office down because of the COVID. And because of that, they, according to when you looked them up on there, it was closed permanently, they said. I don't know if they reopened it, but this is how I got it. I kept praying, kept praying and, you know, doing that. And she was doing the same. And uh, I ended up getting a tattoo removal service uh, connection. So I have a worker for, I'm also connected with tattoo removal. Uh, it's a special program where they give you a worker to help you get your life back on order. So that's what I'm working with too. I've been with them for almost five years now. Um, they had to also shut down during the COVID too. But so when they opened back up, immediately I told him my situation where I needed a birth certificate because to help you get things, uh, even over here, it's good to have a birth certificate. Just, you know, you never know what you're going to need these things. They're documents. And they're real official documents that you need in life, your birth certificate, your social security card, so on and so forth. So um, he took me to this Van Nuys court. We went there before. They wouldn't do it. But this time we went in again and somehow the door the door opened. I This dude, I told him, look, I'm um, special needs. Like I told him, look, I have uh, problems like we're reading and comprehension. I went to special ed school. I really need help, sir. And I kind of got a little loud, you know, because <laughs> they're always trying to push you away. Nobody wants to help you. So then when I kind of raised my voice and acted up a little bit, then finally somebody came out and he said, hold on, hold on, sir, come with me. And it and it's hey, that opened up the window. And because of that, I come, I, you know, I was took a little breath and went in there. This man helped me fill out the paperwork. I got my birth certificate and that's what I needed. That's the start of my getting my passport. So I went from that. And then I was thinking, you know, I hope because of the record I got, it's not serious, but you don't never know what other people think in their countries, if they're going to let you come through. So I was like, Oh Lord, please don't let nothing happen because of this. So, um, I was like, you know, let's see what happened. So I filled out the paperwork, paid for it. And it came back and they gave me my passport. I was like, wow, this <laughs> great this is great little by little more and by more i have my passport but then to go to africa you have to have special shots yellow feet shot. and i i kept going to all kinds of places where i live i live in the valley so i went to all kinds of facilities to try to find this yellow fever shot they'd say oh this place that place every place no but place was open the doors were shut down and uh and the other place i would go to they were like no we don't do that here so then i don't know it just kept bouncing around till i met a place that that place sent me to the right place and it happened to be at Costco. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, would you believe that? But to get that, you have to become a member at Costco to be able to get that. So I had to become a member at Costco, which is awesome. Awesome. So then uh, I got my yellow fever shot. I got that. Boom. Everything went good. Uh, and then I had to go get to Visa. So my first time ever going out of the United States, I was like, wow. First of all, I was real nervous and scared and excited all at the same time. Uh, I got the visa finally to go through because at first it was hard because they asked all kinds of crazy questions. And then I just kept answering. And I told them everything, the truth. And then uh, the truth will set you free. So that's <laughs> exactly what it did. It set me free. And uh, I got those plane tickets, round trip, went out there. I married her. But it took time. We had to fight for our, our marriage out there. And um, 
in Africa and Kenya because uh, it's not easy getting married out there. They want to know a lot of stuff. You have to go to, um, I'm trying to think, the U.S. Embassy. Yeah, the U.S. Uh, embassy in Kenya. They have different embassies for every every different place. But since I'm from U.S., I have to go to the U.S. Embassy. I went there and they asked me questions. You just honest with them and they help you out. And they stamp it. You pay a little bit of money and go on your way. And that's what happened. And everything just worked out for the good. Now, um, with their family, did you yeah. have to go through any kind of cultural, um, traditional, you know, kind of ceremonies or pay a dowry or anything like that? Well, because usually you do have to do that kind of stuff. But because uh, my wife already had children and she was single, um, it was a different thing. I still helped out anyways. I touch upon all the family members, whoever I can help, you know. Um, what I can. And then, you know, God gets me on my feet later strong. You know how that goes. We always family can take care of family, especially out there in those kind of situations. You know, when you when you leave to go out of the United States, you humble yourself immediately. You learn quick. There is dowries to be paid. But for my situation, she's older and it wasn't like that. So we did get married and we just still had a special ceremony in the jungle. Um, we had two marriages. We had one we had in the church, that's the first marriage to us because we're believers of Jesus. Um, we had one in the church, which is the most important one, when God uh, unites you in the church mm -hmm. um, under oath in, in Jesus, under the God, under God. So after that one was done, we had to get the real paperwork so her, for her to come to America because that's our plans right now. That's our dream is to get her and my, my daughter. Uh, we have two daughters from over there, but one of them's in China right now. She's a teacher. So she's somewhere doing what she does. And one is uh, just turned 18 and she, we want her to come to America too. The reason why is because we all want to work and save our money for a better life because we're only getting older in life, you know, and we want to make sure that our family's taken care of. That's it. <laughs> Do you watch 90 Day Fiance? No. What's that? Oh, you got to watch it, Rob. <laughs> it, it's um, a reality show on people who either are from the U.S. and they're marrying someone from another country and they're bringing them over or that person in the U.S. is going there. That that one, they have different little um, spinoffs. So it's like 90 Day Fiance, where it's like from them just dating and talking to the U.S. person is going to visit and they're engaging the families and all that stuff. And the whole process, the whole K-1 visa process and all this kind of stuff. And then the 90 day fiance, the other way is when the U S person is going to go over there and live. Oh, okay. In the U S to, to live in the other country, but okay. yeah, it's, it's, it's really good because especially when people come from other countries to the U S then of course they have to learn the ways of America. They got to go through the whole citizenship process. And so it just takes you through, all of that kind of stuff, the things that you're probably going through. <laughs> right now. Oh, yeah. I, I, I've actually lived in uh, Kenya for uh, the first time I went and married her. I was there for a half a year, six months. Oh, wow. And then I went back a second time and I stayed for 90 days. So I've been there for nine months. You add three more and I have a year almost. There. <laughs> I love it over there. I do. I prefer to actually live over there. That's our plans. But Money wise, uh, there's no work out there. You have to start your own business. The only way to survive. So yeah. by that, uh, that's the goal to come work um, over here, uh, help, uh, you know, help the community do what we need to do, uh, give back here, you know, to help. That's the thing. That's what the government wants when you come to this country is to what can you do to help us instead of ask for handouts. They want you to help the, the situation. You want you to be part of the solution. And that's what we want to be part of. Yes. It's funny. And you won't believe it. My wife in her country, they closed it down, but she used to be a social worker. Oh, wow. <laughs> Is that awesome or what? <laughs> God, what does she think about your journey with her being a social worker? She's amazed how, uh, how I was able to connect and get through this. And she knows she's a, a true believer in, in the Lord. You know, she knows that it was all God's doing. We can't take any of the credit. None of it. To God be the glory. Yeah. And I see your shirt. What does it say? You need Jesus? <laughs> I, I totally, I totally just, I represent him like to the fullest. My life is all dedicated to the Lord. I know that uh, my whole life is a trial and tribulation of a giant testimony that's going to be given to the world. 
and part of this McLaren Hall and in other places too. I know God's going to use me. That's my purpose and why I'm still alive. That's right. That's right. Well, that's a perfect way for us to end. <laughs> that was great. But everyone, again, you know, make sure you're subscribed to the channel, like the video, share it, share it, share it. If there's anyone else who is a survivor of McLaren Hall and this LA County foster care system, please reach out. My email address is info at urbanspinster.com, which will be in the description uh, below the video. And, you know, share your story. Um, there was one person and I've only had one negative um, comment from someone who was uh, in McLaren Hall as well growing up. And, you know, she felt like this was triggering. And, you know, why are people still talking about it? It's triggering. But then she removed her comment before I could even respond. So I'm just like, it's helping more people than it's hurting. Right. You That's know, right. people need to tell their stories. People need their peace. Yeah. People, it helps. It helps. And people are really damaged from this. And there's people out so many, there's, I want to say thousands of people in the United States of America, all over downtown LA that are strung out on drugs and suicidal and mentally ill um, and spiritually and physically because of this situation. And it needs to come to an end. They need peace. Exactly. Need and we need to do something so it doesn't continue to happen because there's still kids in this system. LA County is still the la largest uh, county uh, with children in the foster care system. Yes. And yes. McLaren Hall is not being used for the same purpose anymore. They've just repurposed the building. It's still there, but it's more being used for administrative uh, offices and files and things of that nature. So you still have kids who need emergency placement and they're placing them in hotels or what? Airbnbs. Yeah. What's so, that? you know, the system has been broken for decades and you know, trying to get to the bottom of why that is, mm -hmm. is the the mission that I have or, or trying to connect some dots because we probably won't ever make sense of it, but just try to connect the dots is, okay, oh, this is why they did this and that. You know, is it a money grab? Is it political? Is it, you know, what, what was really going on that all of these thousands of children have been affected like you were? So, you know, again, thank you, Robert, for sharing your story. You're welcome. You know, I wish you the best and I hope you can um, get added on to one of these L.A. County lawsuits for, you know, your your childhood being destroyed, basically. But you are coming through. And like you said, you have a testimony. Thank you. May I say one more thing? <laughs> Joyce Barella, if you get to see this video, that's my lovely wife. I love you. And one day God will have us together. I miss you. And I love you. All right. Amen. <laughs> Okay, Robert, thank you.